Neil deGrasse Tyson is a very popular astrophysicist. He's also an author who tries to communicate science to the general public. I thought his take on African people was interesting and worthy of discussion. To paraphrase, in his interview with Joe Rogan, he was essentially saying that every human attribute on the spectrum from the greatest to the least you will find in Africa because of its genetic diversity. Today, I wanted to explore how this perspective parallels with African history. What up African world, it's Home Team here and welcome back to another video of African history, culture, and worldview. By supporting this channel on Patreon, you're helping in the creation of these videos and contributing to this content. The link to Patreon is in the description box below. Also, stay tuned with a word from my sponsors. Have you ever wanted to learn an African language? If so, keep watching. There are many ways to connect to different African cultures. Many do it through the enjoyment of the music, the dancing, and my personal favorite, the food. But when it comes to learning the languages, that can be a bit challenging. So, here we are. We here at Speak Afrique are trying to lay the groundwork to build that bridge with our new short phrases and vocabulary series. These are the seed projects to something much larger that we're building. We currently have languages such as Dwi, Kikongo, Mandinka, Igbo, and many more will be added as time goes on. So, if you want to start your journey to connecting to Mama Africa, head over to Speak Afrique at iTunes or Amazon and let's start learning together. To begin, this video is designed to draw parallels between Neil deGrasse Tyson's sagacious take on African people and the historical events within Africa. So ultimately, this video is theory based. However, keep in mind that I will be drawing from factual information. In his interview with Joe Rogan, Neil deGrasse Tyson advanced a very interesting perspective on African people. At the core, he was saying that because humans originated in Africa, Africans have the greatest genetic diversity. Because of this wide spectrum, we should expect to find the tallest and shortest people in the world in Africa and the fastest and slowest people in the world in Africa. His most salient point is where I would like the focus of this video to be. He said that we should also expect to find the smartest person in the world in Africa and the least intelligent person in the world also in Africa. He demonstrated his points and defended his position quite well. One point that stood out to me was when he suggested that we know the fastest person in the world because we're actively looking for them and that they're quite often African or of African descent. However, we don't know the slowest person in the world because we're not actually looking for them. That also remains true for the least intelligent person in the world. Nobody is really looking for them. He continued this line of thinking and applied it historically to European anthropologists. Because of their prejudice, European anthropologists, missionaries, historians, and others were not looking for the smartest person in the world in Africa. What they were looking for were justifications and angles to colonize more effectively. Here is the parallel I see. Early European visitors were also not looking for civilization on par or greater than their own in Africa. European philosophers since the 18th century like Immanuel Kant and David Hume colored African people as naturally inferior. And so, there was no civilization to discover. Hume and Kant held the view that Africans in virtue of their blackness are precluded from the realm of reason and civilization. Their views were not some isolated incident. This was the popular mythology of the time. Interestingly enough, when European observers did encounter African civilization, they created more mythology to explain it away. But we'll get into that later. So what are the parallels between Neil's genetic diversity theory and African history? If his perspective on African intelligence has any validity, we should expect to see some very impressive reflections of African intellect that wasn't occurring anywhere else during the same period. And I think that's something that can be illustrated. One of the most impressive things about Africa is that most African people completely skipped the Bronze Age and went straight into iron. 
The traditional developmental pattern around the world was the Stone Age, Bronze Age, and then the Iron Age. But most Africans, for whatever reason, completely skipped the Bronze Age. Now, of course, this in and of itself is not an indication of being on the extreme positive end of the intellectual spectrum. However, combined with other aspects, it becomes very impressive. According to scholars Etienne Zangato and Augustine Hall, iron technology started in the Central African Republic. At Obowi, all the steps in the smelting and forging of iron all of what archaeologists call the chain operatoire are represented in materials from the excavated workshop, furnace structures, two rays, iron bits, slag, and stone anvils for hammering the iron, along with large quantities of datable charcoal. These sites of around 4,000 years ago represent the earliest ironworking yet known, not just in Africa, but anywhere in the world. They are not just too early in time, but separated by far too great a geographical distance to allow for any possible outside of Africa source for the technology. Moreover, iron smelting in Africa was accompanied with another first according to scholar Christopher Eric. Yet there is still another remarkable African first in iron technology that we must take into account. African iron smelters living in the African Great Lakes region began to construct furnaces capable of generating sufficiently high temperatures to produce carbon steel directly from the smelt. And this is no small matter. Europeans did not learn to produce steel by a single step until the invention 2,000 years later in the 19th century. The Chinese were also ahead of the West in this respect. They had developed capacities for directly producing steel by the 11th century CE. But even their advance took place centuries after African smelters already had attained this capability. I think most people would agree that iron technology was a very important development in human history, and the fact that Africans were the first humans to do this aligns with Neil deGrasse's point. Due to their ossified stance concerning African inferiority, European observers found themselves in intellectually compromising positions when encountering African civilization. We see this cognitive dissonance with their discovery of Great Zimbabwe and the Yoruba sculptures of Eleife. Historians, anthropologists, missionaries, and others simply could not abandon old models. The Africa that is portrayed in books by Western ethnologists and historians is the Africa of the savage Africans who did nothing, developed nothing, or created nothing historical. Despite this popular narrative, European observers did not think in monolithic fashion. There were some who were honest about what they saw and gave credit to the African progenitors. They were aware that the premise did not always match observation. Many people today, scholar and layman alike, polemically approach an indigenous African origin of Egyptian civilization. A proliferated acceptance of it would make Neil deGrasse's argument seemingly unassailable. Egyptian civilization is considered by some to be the greatest in human history. One European philosopher and abolitionist of the 18th century seemed convinced about the origin of Egyptian civilization, not only claiming it to be the product of black intellect, but espousing the idea that Africans were the first learned men in human history. Ostensibly, the words of Constantine de Volney serve as a parallel to Neil deGrasse Tyson's point. Here's what he had to say. We have the strongest reasons to believe that the country neighboring to the tropic was the cradle of the sciences and, of consequence, that the first learned nation was a nation of blacks. For it is incontrovertible that by the term Ethiopians the ancients meant to represent a people of black complexion, thick lips, and woolly hair. I am therefore inclined to believe that the inhabitants of Lower Egypt were originally a foreign colony imported from Syria and Arabia, a medley of different tribes of savages, originally shepherds and fishermen, who by degrees formed themselves into a nation, and who by nature and descent were enemies of the Thebans, by whom they were no doubt despised and treated as barbarians. I have suggested the same ideas in my travels into Syria, founded upon the black complexion of the Sphinx. 
I have since ascertained that the antique images of Thebius have the same characteristic. Now this is not an appeal to an 18th century European authority, but it goes to show that some saw the stark contradictions in the disparaging narrative and presented a countervailing belief that Africa is actually the cradle of the sciences, a belief that strongly parallels points made by Neil deGrasse Tyson. So what do you guys think? Does the historical evidence support Neil deGrasse's theory? In other words, does African history reflect both extreme ends of the human spectrum? Let me know your thoughts in the comments below. And if you like these videos and want to help in its continued production, consider supporting the home team on Patreon.com. The link is in the description box below. Know thyself. Remember your ancestors. Peace.